Welcome back. Thanks for joining me on this discussion of postoperative care and some of the common problems that we may see in the postoperative period in this section of perioperative care. Let's first visit tachycardia. You know, when I was a resident, one of the things that we were always most afraid of is being called by the nurse to the bedside and told that your patient had a sinus tachycardia. Why is that? I'll show you in a second. Look at this laundry list of potential differential diagnosis, all of which you have to rule out. Pain is probably one of the most common post-operative or post-surgery causes of tachycardia, but patients can, have be, can actually be having a myocardial infarction or pulmonary embolism, hypovolemia, maybe an infection, anxiety, bleeding, hypoxia, withdrawal if the patient has history of alcohol, or they may be developing sepsis. And when you look at this laundry list of problems, you can understand why we always get a little tachycardic when we get called to the bedside for evaluation of patient sinus tachycardia. Let's evaluate one of the causes of pulmonary embolism. What are some risk factors for pulmonary embolism? First, any major surgery or any periods of immobility. This is the perfect storm for surgical patients because they undergo major surgery and for a period of time, it may be painful due to incisions in which, in which the, case be, the patients become immobile. How do we prevent DVTs and subsequent pulmonary embolism? Well, we get pharmacologic DVT prophylaxis in the setting of uh, surgery. Sometimes we give the pharmacologic DVT prophylaxis before even making an incision. The choice of DVT prophylaxis is up to you and your institution. There is some evidence that sequential compression devices may also help, although by themselves are not sufficient to prevent DVTs and subsequent pulmonary embolism. Diagnosis of pulmonary embolism may be aided by getting an arterial blood gas. In an arterial blood gas, generally we demonstrate hypoxia, but very importantly, hypocarbia. That's because most patients with pulmonary embolism also hyperventilate, causing a reduction in the CO2. How do we treat pulmonary embolism? Unfortunately, a lot of it is up to your own body to break down the clot. Remember, the same clot process that allows us to stop bleeding also has a mechanism by which clots are broken down in an organized fashion. We give systemic anticoagulation for two reasons. Number one, to decrease the propagation of further clot, both in the legs and in the um, lungs. And number two, to decrease inflammatory response. Let's move on to a discussion of myocardial infarction in the postoperative period. On the far left side of the screen, you see a normal EKG. And as highlighted by the green bars, you see various changes when a patient may have a myocardial infarction. We can see hyperacute T waves, ST elevation, Q waves and T wave inversions. And in the fourth quadrant, you see when the ST elevation has improved, depending on when you actually capture the EKG. In patients who have had a myocardial infarction, there may actually be Q waves that persist even though the T waves have normalized. Coupled with the troponin, this may be highly sensitive for a myocardial infarction. What happens during a myocardial infarction is that the coronary vessels are not perfusing the heart enough with oxygen. And our main goal of the pre-op workup is to predict and try to prevent a post-operative myocardial infarction. Remember, patients who pre present with uh, myocardial infarctions, particularly in the postoperative period, may have atypical symptoms. And because the, pain, the, because the pain, patient may be experiencing pain elsewhere, it may be masked by other surgical pain. Remember, get an EKG and a set of troponins. These are high-value, low-cost studies. If the patient is determined to have a myocardial infarction, we initiate monotherapy. And we also start statins to reduce in-hospital mortality. MONA stands for morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, and aspirin. Let's move on to fevers as potential causes of tachycardia and fevers in general in the postoperative period. 
if a clinical scenario is presented to you in the immediate post-op period, within a few days of surgery, the most likely cause of fevers is atelectasis. Patients can also develop pneumonias and urinary tract infections in the post-op period. DVTs is also a possibility. So are foreign objects. Do you have a central line in? Is there a urinary catheter inspection? Did you implant mesh during an inguinal hernia repair? repair? Did the orthopedic surgeon put any new hardware or implants in joints? And lastly, but not, uh, but not any less important, is surgical site infections, particularly uh, uh, deep surgical site infections such as intra-abdominal abscesses. Intra-abdominal abscesses take time to form, and typically no imaging study is usually useful until about post-op day number four or five for intra-abdominal surgeries. A word of caution, however, immediate surgical site infections can be of the necrotizing infection variety. In these patients, there can be rapid deterioration if the surgical site infection is not recognized. This is why we always teach our residents and students, look at the surgical wound. It is potentially a common site of postoperative fevers. Let's ask you a question about a clinical scenario. A ward nurse calls you in the post-op period to report desaturation in your patient. What might be some of the causes of a low saturation or pulse oximetry? I'll give you a second to think about this. Here are some etiologies of hypoxia. Poor inspiratory effort. Sounds silly. Patients who have pain splint and do not breathe and subsequently contribute to atelectasis. Remember, we do not spend the vast majority of waking hours in a recumbent position. If your patient is immediately post-operative, that's why we encourage them to move about and ambulate. We do not want them to be recumbent. Recumbency of even a few minutes causes dependent atelectasis. As a result of atelectasis, pneumonia can occur. And pneumonia in the post-operative period is usually unlikely unless there was already a pre-existing community-acquired pneumonia that was subclinical and not diagnosed. And lastly, a very important etiology of hypoxia is pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism is a low probability, however, highly significant finding. Therefore, we recommend that you have a low threshold for seeking pulmonary embolism, particularly in the postoperative period. How do we treat desaturations? First, prior to even knowing exact diagnoses, give the patient supplemental oxygen. What if the patient's hypoxic because they're having a myocardial infarction? We want to make sure that enough oxygen is delivered to the systemic system, especially the coronary systems. Get an ABG, arterial blood gas. Maybe the information can be helpful in terms of diagnosing a pulmonary embolism. That is defined by hypoxia and hypocarbia, or low CO2. And sometimes chest x-rays are incredibly helpful, particularly if there's concern for pneumonia. If the clinical scenario warrants or fits, maybe there's a tension pneumothorax or a pneumothorax from your procedure. Let's move on to a different scenario. Now, you're on call and a different nurse calls and says, Mrs. Jones is difficult to arouse. What are you thinking? What's your differential diagnosis, particularly in the post-operative period? I'll give you a moment to think about this. Mental status changes are common in the hospital particularly in the elderly. Here's our important questions that I ask whenever I receive that call. First, is the patient protecting her airway? And remember from our trauma lectures that an intact airway or a conduit doesn't necessarily mean that the patient is actually moving air. That's the B of breathing. Remember, if the patient has a inability to protect airway or is not moving air, early intubation is recommended. Were their neurological findings consistent with a stroke? These are typically called lateralizing signs. It's fairly rare to have only mental status changes associated with the stroke. Typically speaking, there is some one-sided paresis. And it's also important to dig through the chart and make sure that neurological findings were not already pre-existing. Lastly, was there a recent sedative or anxiolytic medications administered? Particularly, particularly in narcotic naive patients, small doses of morphine or fentanyl can cause significant mental status changes. And in the elderly patient, remember sundowning is very common. 
when we are taken out of our familiar rec uh, circumstances and surroundings, brought into the hospital and subjected to surgery, one shouldn't be surprised, particularly in the elderly patient population, that some people get confused. Are there any adjunctive studies that should, we should get? Well, we talked about an ABG. Maybe hypoxia is the reason why the patient has mental status changes. An EKG. An EKG may tell us whether or not the patient has had a myocardial infarction. Chest x-ray may explain why there may be a hypoxia, or maybe there is an infection that's causing the patient to have mental status changes. And of course, a CAT scan of the head to evaluate for either a space occupying issue or a stroke. Remember, early on in a stroke, the CT head may be completely negative, and that might call for a repeat head CT. It's fairly unlikely for a patient to have a new onset bleed unless they fell in the hospital. Using DVT chemical prophylaxis alone has very, very low incidence of intra-hospital uh, intracranial bleeding. Now let's go over some important take-home clinical pearls and high-yield information. Remember, sometimes in the post-operative period, you might have to institute therapy prior to knowing the diagnosis. For example, Mrs. Jones, who had altered mental status, although you may not know why she has altered mental status, if she's not having a protected airway or breathing, you will have to intubate the patient prior to having the actual diagnosis. After you manage the life-threatening um, deterioration, you then move on to further workup. High yield information for your examination. Please consider pulmonary embolism in a patient who is hypoxic and hyperventilating. Hyperventilation is demonstrated on an arterial blood gas, or ABG, as low carbon dioxide. Thank you very much for joining me on this discussion of postoperative care. <music>